Welcome to this year's Emerging Translator Mentorship Showcase, celebrating the great work of our 2023 mentees and mentors and giving you, our digital audience, a glimpse of who our emerging translators are and what they've been working on since October 2022. My name is Rebecca DeWald and I am the Emerging Translator Mentorships Program Manager at the National Centre for Writing. Established in 2010 by Daniel Han, the Emerging Translator Mentorships Program is now in its 13th year. Its aim is to develop successive new cohorts of literary translators into English, particularly for languages whose literature is currently underrepresented in English translation. The scheme matches up experienced translators with emerging literary translators for a six-month period, during which they work together on practical translation projects, developing their craft through working on a chosen text or texts. Mentees receive a bursary and their mentorship also includes an industry week, especially tailored to the needs of emerging translators as well as a visit to London Book Fair and a day trip to NCW's headquarters at the Medieval Dragon Hall in Norwich. Since its inception, the programme has supported 122 mentees working in 35 languages. From first mentees Vinit Lal and Anna Homewood, to mentees turned mentors Rosie Hedger, Paul Russell Garrett, Jean Gasparbay and Nicholas Morley, to name but a few in a select list of translators' names. The programme would not be what it is without the enthusiasm of Vicky Maitland so a huge thank you to you for your dedication to the programme. The mentorship also would not exist without the commitment of our mentors and the support from our partners. We are immensely grateful to the myriad of funders who have made the programme possible for the past decade and more. We would like to thank our mentors and funders this year. Thanks to Arts Council England, to Savad Hussein for mentoring Ibrahim Said Farsi with funding from the Sheikh Zayed Book Award, Thanks to Paul Russell Garrett, who's been working with Hazel Evans, funded by the Danish Arts Foundation. To Howard Curtis, who's been mentoring Antonella Lettieri with support from the Instituto Italiano di Cultura. Juliet Winters Carpenter for mentoring Kat Anderson, supported by the Tadashi Yanai Initiative for Globalizing Japanese Humanities at UCLA and Vasada University. Anton Ho for mentoring Jean Peng, supported by LTI Korea. To our Hindi mentor, Daisy Rockwell, who has been working with Bebaf Sharma as part of the Sarosh Lal Mentorship. Rosie Hedger has been mentoring Olivia Blythe, supported by the Royal Norwegian Embassy. Thanks to Jean Gaspar Bay for mentoring David Mobilaji with support from the Polish Cultural Institute in London. Sarah Arizzoni, who has been mentoring Claire Gallander Drolet as part of a mentorship in Quebec French, enabled by the Quebec Government Office in London. Mina Kandasami for mentoring Ime Wallace Humphreys as part of NCW's Visible Communities Programme, coordinated by my colleague Kate Griffin. Thanks to Nicholas Morley for acting as Swedish mentor to Megan Evans, funded by the Swedish Arts Council. To Nina Murray for working under difficult circumstances with Tatiana Savchinska, our Ukrainian mentee based in Lviv. And to Karini Baroka, who doubled the trouble, as it were, working with mentees Didit Budiman and Sikar Larsati the winners of this year's Harvard Sector Young Translators Prize in Indonesian. The introductions and readings were recorded in advance. If you're joining us live for our premiere, you can participate in the live chat on the right side of this page. Our emerging translators will be watching and maybe responding. The translators will be reading short extracts from their mentorship projects. Foreign rights to the translations are all still available. If you'd like to read a longer extract, we will be including a link to the ebook version of this year's anthology at the end of this video and in the show notes. If you're interested in contacting the translators directly, you will find their contact details in the anthology itself. Alternatively, feel free to get in touch with us at NCW via info at nationalcenterforwriting.org.uk. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy the following showcase presenting you the finest work by new literary translation talents working today. My name is Ibrahim Fauzi, and I'm an Arabic to English translator based in Egypt. I focus on bringing narratives from Africa and the Middle East to wider audiences. I think translation is like dancing between two languages. So I work on everything from literary fiction to creative nonfiction and academic writing. The following sample comes from the Mauritanian writer Ahmed Esselmo's Feud City. It's a sci-fi novel that tackles timely, problematic topics of immigration and digital specificity weaving a fantastical relationship between the Mauritanian music and artificial intelligence. It also celebrates Hassaniya. 
a variety of Arabic found in many African countries and is recognized as a language of national identity in Mauritania. Estranged from time and space, the protagonist of Feud City is haunted by anonymous death threat messages in this excerpt of the novel. Do you think Feud City can hide you? In less than two minutes after the first message, a second one arrived. He felt a slight tingling that began from the right part of his head and traveled down to his knees. A sudden mirage appeared between his car and the one ahead. He turned right into the side street, known as Service Street. There were only a few cars, some of which were parked so their owners could sip some coffee to kickstart their long day. He parked his car at a paid parking lot and sent a text message to withdraw enough money to pay for 10 hours. He then walked at the glass bridge crossing over the torrential river of vehicles. For three minutes, he stopped and grasped the metal handrail fixed to the brake proof glass of the bridge. His mind wandered for a few seconds while he was following the movement of metros, two of which across the railway along the city, arrive at a specific time and stop where they're meant to. The metros don't care about the shouts of the late man, shouldering a heavy bag, the carriage doors closing a fraction of a second before he reaches. This split second will force him to wait for four more minutes until the next metro arrives. And this for him would mean losing money. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Hazel Evans, and I'm a translator from Danish to English. I've been mostly working on a lot of contemporary stuff, um, but within that kind of everything from literary fiction and some memoirs, and then I've got one graphic novel I'm working on as well, and that won't be the one I read from because it's a bit hard to read out, but um, the excerpt I'm going to read today is from a book called now I will begin to speak, these words can find a way. Um, and the author's name is Gru Stockendale Dalgas. And it's a very thin book, as you can see. Um, and I kind of describe it as a sort of carrier bag memoir. Um, it's a quite concise prose, and it is set in the meantime between transitioning from man to woman. Um, whilst Gru is waiting for her first appointment at the gender dysphoria clinic. And she's uh, sort of throughout this book is beginning to find her voice as a woman. Um, and then so the opening page that I'm going to read from is an Instagram post. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and this is from the Instagram account of Kristen Dalgas, which is Gru's name before she changed it. And uh, I'm going to read uh, from that, and then I'll read from the second page of the book, which is just uh, regular prose. So, um, Christian, now Gru, posts uh, this screenshot of like a note written in a notes app um, on Instagram, and the note goes like this. Hi. I saw right through my depression and thought about my life since I became a teenager. I've had gender dysphoria ever since my testosterone made a man of me. I don't know why I tried to forget how uncomfortable I felt in my own skin, maybe to make life easier, to fit in. For as long as I can remember, I've been trying to find a place where I'd fit in, a place that would also be the answer to so much. From now on, I'll begin to dream that place up inside me and not give up, because my body wants to be a man and I don't. I'll begin to go in the way I feel comfortable in, the way I must if I'm to live life for my own sake. Um, and then the next page is, uh, yeah, regular prose. My phone lights up the ceiling. Things are happening on the internet and I don't want to check them. Some likes, some comments. I'm disgusting. I'm loved. I really went and wrote it, broke through the mask. Now I'll begin to speak. These words can find a way. Awake again, the night cuts short, and I don't feel at home. 
I can't quite put my finger on it. It's like the feeling I had when I was ten years old and I dropped the porcelain dog. I'm twenty-six now, and my upstairs neighbor is taking a shower. I have a girlfriend orchid on my windowsill, in a room that really is my room, everything in its place. What had happened? I watched the music video. There's mold between the wall and the bed. I scrub away at it with bleach and open the window. I take a break from scrubbing and open a new window on my computer. And that is all I have. Hello, my name is Ahav Sharma, and I'm an IT translator from Saharanpur, India. I work between Hindi and English languages. Um, I'm currently working on a collection of short stories, which is a, which is about various people on the margin of society. It is written by a well-known Hindi writer and journalist Anil Yadav. I'm mostly interested in the works which deal with various dialects of Hindi language, and the stories in this collection do contain words from Mathili, Pochpuri, Khadi Boli, etc. The excerpt I'm going to read today is from a short story titled Lord Almighty Grant Us Riot. It's a story of a colony of weavers who are right now flooded and their colony submerged in water. They are living in abject poverty and trying to grab the attention of people in power. The excerpt goes as follows. The sun shone harsh and bright that day, and a scalding steam rose from the water. Six small new coffins lay in a row atop a heap of garbage in the middle of the sludge. Beyond them, all the way to the edges of Mamanpura, a lake of sewage, others with mosquitoes, crashed in waves. The bloated bodies of several cats and a donkey floated in it. A boat rocked in the water opposite the drifting debris and water hastened. The phrase, will come and dry it, was clumsily scrawled in white paint on one side of the boat. A small flag woven of shimmering gold threads fluttered at the tip of the boat. The stench was unbearable. Everyone had covered their faces with kafiyas or gumshas except for the children. Behind the men stood the women, bursting into intermittent bouts of sobs and hiccups. Their burkas and kurtas hitched up to their knees. Occasionally, a faint tremor of wailing rose from the group, only to be whisked away by the wind. All of them awaited the boat that would take them to the graveyard on the other side of the slum. But the boat with the fluttering flag seemed to mock them, as if to say that it would only cross when there were riots. Otherwise, it couldn't be sure if there really were dead bodies in the coffin or something else. Thank you. It would be a thrill for us to share unique works of Indonesian literature with the world. We hope our excitement carries through our future translations. Uh, the following sample is taken from the novel. When I approached them, a door to a cathedral's confessional was in the middle of telling their story. There they stood still, watching humans one by one kneel in front of the tightly barred booth. Behind it was another human. This door was indisputably a silent witness. They had heard countless astonishing confessions from humans that, from a glance, seemed perfect and pious. There were role models considered by the masses to be incapable of committing any grave wrongdoing. Others were people who thought themselves to have sinned because the people around them asserted they had. They had witnessed a famous singer admit the fervent worshipping of a false god, for their fetish had granted them the voice of an angel. They had also witnessed a politician declare their desperate desire to resign, for they believed they were devoid of talent other than evading questions and spreading dissent. Some confessed the things that were an immutable part of themselves. A pair of conjoined twins thought themselves cursed and began to list their sins, begging for absolution. Another was a woman who kept questioning why she could not hold any love for a man, wondering if she had not done enough good in her life. The confessional door then listed the names of people who had come to them. One stood out to me. I recognized it from Garthas newspaper. I pressed 
I pressed them. What did they confess to? The door refused to elaborate. A workplace secret thing replied. They replied. Their stories left me with a suffocating sense of sorrow. I thought prison cell doors hold the most amount of misery compared to the other. I was wrong. Hello, my name is Antonella Lettieri and I am a translator based in London and working between Italian and English. I'm interested in translating literary fiction that is experimental, has a strong voice, or simply sweeps the reader off their feet with the power of its prose. I also have a soft spot for memoirs that are compelling stories, especially if written by women. The following sample comes from the collection of short stories by Enrico Remmert entitled La Guerra dei Murazzi, or The War of the Murazzi in my translation. The title story captures the time when Italy transformed from a monocultural country into a multicultural society. This theme is explored through a civil war fought along the Murazzi, the arches on the banks of the River Po. The narrator, Manu, like many of her peers, embraces multiculturalism enthusiastically, despite also feeling confused and strangely fascinated by some of the ugliest and most violent consequences of immigration and marginalization. Here is the sample. Back in those days, I lived near the station, a place of arrivals and departures in every possible way, and I walked in a bar down there at the Murazzi, in one of those places overlooking the river banks. And those days were the years between the 90s and the noughties, and there were still days when I wasn't like I wanted to be, but I wanted to be like I believed I could become, or at least that's what I kept telling everyone. Because down there at the Murazzi, everyone knew me, and I knew everyone, and some were closer friends, others much less. But at the end of the day, every single one of them had to talk to me, as it was me working behind the bar when they ordered. And it was, Hi Manu, how's it going Manu, 3GMT's Manu, everything all right Manu? And anyway, lots of people used to come to that place, but I don't think many knew it, because to know a place you need to know its ghosts. Otherwise you see only what we were taught to see, only what we learned to believe that place contained. Those who really knew it, on the other hand, understand that at a certain point, a water broke out in that place. Not in the daylight, but by moonlight. And I'm talking about those years when you could still drive onto the banks, and when the North Africans started invading them, and after a certain time of the day, down at the Murazzi, you could only hear the drug dealers yelling and only smell the stinking smoke from the barbecues, and there were fights every day, and every night ended with people being hurt and some nights ended with people being seriously hurt, and some nights ended with someone being dead, even if no one seems to remember anymore. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Kat Anderson, and I translate from Japanese to English. I'm especially interested in sci-fi and fantasy, and also travel writing, but really more than happy to translate um, anything across any genre that captures my interest. Today, I'm really pleased to share a sample from a memoir, The Playground of the Gods by Natsu Miyashita. I'd also like to thank the publisher, Kobinsha, for their permission to share it. In 2013, Miyashita and her family left city life behind and moved from their home on the Japanese mainland to Tomorawishi, a tiny community in the middle of a mountainous national park in Hokkaido, the northernmost of Japan's main islands. The Playground of the Gods is Miyashita's record of this memorable year in the life of her family. In short journal entries, she depicts them braving constant minus temperatures, encountering the local flora and fauna, and finding their feet in the welcoming community. I chose this book because I like Miyashita's gentle humour, her affectionate eye for detail, and her depiction of a slower pace of life in a beautiful place. So here's the extract. Carpenter B. I heard what sounded like the lowing of a cow. A cow? Here? I looked around, only to find it was a ginormous carpenter bee. I was quite chuffed at having discovered that a carpenter bee's wing beats 
sound just like a cow mooing, though I wasn't sure what to do with the information. For now, it was time to beat a swift and silent retreat, leaving the giant bee to its own devices. Bear in the potato patch. When we got home from a family outing today, we came face to face with a Yezo Sika deer in front of the house. We all stood there, ooing and eyeing as it gracefully turned tail and dashed off. We later found out from a neighbour that at that very moment, a vegetable plot just a few hundred metres away had actually been playing host to a brown bear. The bear had clambered over the deer fence and invaded the plot and was digging up the potatoes and helping itself. We all decided that since the bear must have filled up on potatoes, it wouldn't try to be any of us now. Though what is it they say? There's always room for pudding. Hello everyone, my name is Jean Pung and I'm a translator and illustrator based in Seoul. I translate fiction and poetry from Korean to English. I'm drawn to slice of life stories that are intimate and contemplative, books that help us pause for a minute and think through the thoughts and feelings we so often miss as we try to stay afloat life's busy currents. Me, Someday by Lee Juran is one of those books. It tells the story of a young woman's journey to self-discovery after the death of her grandmother, the only family she had left. To help her through trying times are her unnamed roommate and a single dad who lives in the same neighborhood. Through quiet and unimposing ways, the three become each other's strongest pillars of support. Filled with moments that are melancholic yet warm, Me Someday is an ode to found families. I hope you enjoy the sample. We definitely need proper shoes. These slippers are made for walking. I thought as Anni and I looked up at the 63 building. Have you been? Once, when I was little. What's up there? An aquarium. Is it still there? I got a present there. A necklace with a tiny clam sitting in sparkly water. Who gave it to you? My kindergarten teacher. On our way home, we talked about things like this, about walking shoes too. Things that probably cost about 500 to to $1,000. Things that we could afford, but for some reason, don't ever. We live between a necklace and a pair of walking shoes. After our long walks, after passing by so many people, we'll reach home, and in that space it'll be Omni and me. Just us two. It's nice being in a crowd, but lately the quietness of my room appeals to me too. Not like when I lived alone. After a good shower, changing into comfy clothes and lying down on my bed, I'm no longer a person amongst others. I am me. I realize I exist in this world. I am breathing. After a whole day of putting on different costumes and personalities, my body and mind are now nothing but me. And in living as I am, I become myself, and the world becomes mine. Thank you. Hello, I'm Olivia Blythe and I'm a literary translator working from Norwegian to English. I'm really interested in the diversity of contemporary fiction currently being published in Norway. I'm currently based in London. I've been working on a sample translation of a book called Ida Tonansvar, Ida Takes Charge by Shashti Halvorsen. It's Halvorsen's first novel published in 2019 and was nominated for the Taya Vesos debut prize upon publication. It was then adapted for television in Norway last year. Ida is a university student preoccupied by fear of terror attacks like the infamous 2011 shooting in Utøya. It's a very strange, highly perceptive and quite violent story told in Ida's flat-toned first-person narration. It covers gendered violence, isolation and the internet. I think the relevance of its themes and similarity to the prose of successful contemporary writers like Sally Rooney make it really desirable in the English market. I'll read out this short extract. I jump and spill my tea when the doorbell rings. It's ten o'clock. I open the door. A fairly young man stands there. He must be Taye. He reminds me of Theodore, in a way, even though his hair is longer. He has sunglasses, but no white cane. He holds himself against the railing on the stairs. I wonder how he got here. Maybe by taxi. 
Maybe he got the bus and then walked. He reaches out to shake my hand, smiling in an unclear direction. He looks freshly shaven. I wonder how blind people shave. The piano is downstairs, I say. He walks down the stairs in careful steps, holds onto the banister, traces his other hand along the wall, the embossed wallpaper, the framed photos of me and Tia Thor. I can smell it, he says, smiling. I can actually smell a neglected piano from a distance. He turns his head in my direction so that his sunglasses look past me. Maybe he's lying to make himself sound interesting. Sorry is all I can think to say. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Mubalaji. I'm a Polish Nigerian literary translator and junior doctor based in London and I work between English and my native Polish. I like to work on literary fiction and poetry, in particular suspenseful, magical realist stories, meditations on the natural world, as well as narratives from marginalized voices. Today I'll be reading from an extract uh, from the Pavilion of Small Mammals, uh, the lightly fictionalized diary of contemporary Polish writer Patryk Pofelski. Pofelski is a young, Jewish, openly gay zookeeper with a charming affinity for things past. So his book answered questions I didn't quite know I had. How do you nanny a baby flamingo? Is being a vegetarian cyclist really enough to be an enemy of the Polish state? What does a friendship between a 20-something-year-old, self-declared wannabe pensioner, and an octogenarian holocaust survivor look like? Popolski lets us in on funny anecdotes from his day-to-day at the zoo, uh, at the same time offering moving pictures from his family history, the present-day Jewish community in Poland, and life as a queer person under a socially conservative government. The following extract talks of his grandparents and his quirky envy for their lifestyle. 27th of May, 2021. My biggest childhood dream was to go into retirement. I'd fantasize about wearing Randolph Helix clothes and strolling around the table, doing lots of reading, been wolfing down a sweet cheese bun for Levenses and for supper a blanched tomato. I'd play with pill organizers back then, ones my grandparents had got from Auntie Eva and Uncle Vladek from Germany. I'd sit down with them for afternoon coffee, a spot of morning cognac, some more tea, no less ceremonious than the last cuppa, and I'd nod sagely while the conversations flew completely over my head thinking now pal, if this isn't the life. I imagined I'd have to wait half a century for my dream to come true. But now, I find myself sitting, upright, deep in my seat, resting back, in the hospital waiting room on Dorowska Street, reading a book by Dorota Kotas, as I wait patiently for my x-ray report, wearing my warmest green tracksuit, it's windy outside, a fleece, so I can unzip and take it off without struggling to pull it over my head, Light shoes with soft soles. They're just like the granny shoes Krisha once had, I swear. And I just wish there was a mirror here. Because I'd love to wave at Grandad Helik in the reflection. Thank you. My name's Claire Gullandru Trollet, and I'm a writer, translator, and educator currently based in Hong Kong. In addition to French and English, which I grew up speaking in Montreal, I'm a longtime student of Korean, having lived in Busan and Seoul, South Korea, for several years. In my academic writing, I'm interested in thinking about translation as counter-narrative, as a unique form of resistant writing that can, at its best, enable practitioners to counter dominant accounts or narratives of history. As a translator, I gravitate towards writing with a counter-historical bent, and I'm especially fond of literature that celebrates multiplicity in its many forms. Diasporic and border-crossing fiction, particularly from or through Korea, genre and gender-bending literature, and multilingual and experimental writing. The following excerpt is from Japanese-born Korean Montréalais writer Chong's most recent book, La Jeune Fille de la Paix, or Peace Girl. The title refers to the statues memorializing the so-called comfort women, who were young girls sexually enslaved by the Japanese Imperial Army during the long occupation of Korea. In Chong's novel, the Peace Girl becomes a figure for the idea of historical reckoning, 
and allows him to question why women's and girls' contributions to history are so frequently elided. This passage is called Dialogue Between a Bird and Statue. At the entrance to the traditional Korean village in Cheonju, angled in the direction of the old gate called Pungnamun, stands a statue of bronze called the Peace Girl. Quaffed tomboyishly, hair bobbed at the chin, she looks like a student wearing chima tobori, traditional Korean dress. She sits there with a bird perched on her shoulder. The bronze girl spends her days in this public space flanked by an empty chair. Waiting for what or who and since when? No one knows, least of all the tourists who pass by that way. Little bird, I'd feel lonely without you. Thanks for keeping me company. I should be the one thanking you for letting me rest on your shoulder after I've flown all this way. Where did you come from? From an island across the sea. There I met a young girl wreathed in birds, hands toiling to fold 1,000 before she becomes fixed in time like you. And you, who are you? How long have you existed for? I'm a million names. I'm older than this century. You don't look older than 15, 16. People call me Harmony, grandmother. I feel like I've seen you all over the peninsula. In Kunsan, Kimje, Puan, Seoul, you're always depicted as the peace girl. So how could you be a Harmony? My age stopped when they stole my youth. Who stole it from you? The old keepers of the country you flew in from. Come with me, I'll show you. We'll have to return to the past. I'm Megan Evans, a translator from the northwest of England. I specialize in Swedish translation, but I also have experience in both Norwegian and Danish due to my degree in Scandinavian studies. I'm very interested in changing the stereotypical type of output of Swedish translations on the UK book market in terms of genre and gender imbalance, which was the focus of my master's dissertation. By that, I mean the large proportion of Scandinavian fiction on the UK book market being crime thrillers written and translated by men. This is why I chose to translate from Linda Bostrom Nausgaard's highly unique short story collection, Grand Mal. Nausgaard has multiple other works that have been translated into English, yet this collection in its entirety has not been touched, perhaps due to its experimentality. The collection is made up of dark, horror-adjacent short stories, which again is an under-translated genre, and the entire book is filled with an ominous sense of dread and strange unpredictability. It's unlike anything I have read or translated from before, and I believe it really deserves a place in the UK book market. The following short story I am reading a passage from is titled Meanwhile. The drops shimmer like dreams in the night, run in thin threads over the window. Outside, the garden is growing. The leaves that climb up the front of the house tear down plaster and damaged mortar. The roots make their way in tunnels. Displaced stones and rubbish wrap themselves around each other for support. While I wait, I listen to the sounds, to the growth underground and to the roar of the stars. It is nothing I am alone in knowing. It's not the result of heightened consciousness or exhaustion. It is the air that has become different. It transports down as if it were underwater. The rain beats down on old bathtubs and rusty oil barrels, hammers in different keys. I distinguish the sound of rain against tin and rain against tarp and lay them against each other. I hear tubs and barrels being dragged out into the garden, anything that can be collected. I hear empty stomachs filling up. Months can go by without a drop. Some people save their urine, freeze it and use it in emergencies. There are even those who claim it's beneficial. I remember how the necessity to collect water weighed heavily on my head and arms, how the heart's beating urged one to continue. I feel better now. I've never had any inclination to lie. It's no secret that I long for death. I pray for it every waking moment. Now I've resigned myself to the point that I just wait. Since making that decision, my success has increased significantly. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tetyana Sopchinska. I'm a literary translator working between Ukrainian and English, and I'm especially passionate about amplifying the voices of contemporary Ukrainian women writers. Uh, the sample I'm presenting comes from a short story called Water by a contemporary author Katerina Kalitko, 
and it explores the topic of crossing geographical borders and gender binaries in search of safety and identity in violent times. The story is narrated by an orphan girl called Lale, who was raised by her adoptive parents as a boy. In Ukrainian, verbs are grammatically gendered, and it becomes clear from the verb endings that the narrator identifies herself as a girl, while the people around her perceive her as a boy. Verbs don't have the same grammatical markers in English, so I strived to render the protagonist's alienation and shift in identity using other linguistic means. While challenging from a translator's perspective, Kalitko's vivid imagery and haunting prose demonstrate why she is regarded as one of the most important and promising voices in contemporary Ukrainian literature. I hope you enjoy the sample. I wasn't even ten. It had just stopped raining. We raced each other to the pond, fighting through the thicket of wind thorns. Their shrubs always indicated the wind direction of the slopes. I had to stop for a moment. One of the branches tore through my pants, caught my ankle and scratched my leg, so I had to untangle it, while the boys made it all the way to the water, took off their shirts and made running jumps into the cool pond, splashing and screaming. I. I, as she, was watching them and growing cold, but not from the water. Only now I, I, as she, realized how different their bodies were from mine. Their narrow hips, covered with dark hairs, strong legs like the saplings of wind thorns that had been scrambling up the hill before we were born and would be scrambling still after we die. Their firm buttocks like green fruits of a wild apple tree, especially with the halves contracted and clenched tight from the cold. Their backs with rippling muscles, made even more pronounced by the hard work, and the broad shoulders of even the skinniest boys. An eye was a lump of daw that grew mellow in the warmth, and stretched out her white, tender lips, searched for curves to recreate them, smoothed things over, swelled with prohibited softness, and grew heavy with the promise of tenderness. Each of my friends had a sign of their sex, just a shy, childish flower bud that was submerged unexpectedly into cold water, and yet I would never be in possession of such a flower. I felt as if I, I, as she, suddenly found an invisible splinter that had pained me for years, wandering through my body. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Emir Wallace Humphreys. I translate from Portuguese and Welsh to English and from English to Welsh, and I'm taking part in the Visible Communities Mentorship with Mina Kandasami. I am mostly interested in literary and speculative fiction, especially short stories, but I'm also interested in promoting Welsh literature and translation in general. Uh, this is a sample from Owen Owen's Adith Olaf, which I translated as The Last Day which is a postmodern science fiction novel which came out in 1976. It is a sample from the final diary entry of protagonist Mac at the Sunset House, where swathes of the human race have been gathered, assimilated and finally catalogued. Even though this is his final entry, it comes at the beginning of the novel and we are left to piece together the events leading up to this moment. And this is the extract. I never did learn why they made us keep diaries, nor why they're microfilmed and fed to the computer general. Something to do with social studies, I think. Discovering weaknesses in the system, the failures of the assimilation regime. They're clever but not clever enough, because they forgot one little thing. That the computer general's translation program for sub-languages was deleted ages ago. And he doesn't know that I know. The all-knowing computer general doesn't speak my mother tongue. This diary would be digested by his electronic stomach without so much as a hiccup. He'll find nothing forbidden written here because he doesn't understand a word of this lowly language, and everything, forbidden or not, will be microfilmed and safely stored in his electronic memory. That's right, a complete diary, as well as instructions on how to find the other documents, the letters and all, stored in the final diaries section, subsection, unintelligible, sub-subsection, semi-logical. Brilliant. How lucky I am that the electromagnetic messages from outer space, from Alpha Omega, trouble him, frighten him. I'm lucky the computer general's competence is finite after all, straining under the weight of responding effectively to Alpha Omega's ridiculous demands, needing all his computational power to analyze the messages. 
deleting the smaller programs that are apparently irrelevant. Poor sods. A translation program the computer general doesn't need anymore. It's the funniest thing. When will people, if a person is what he is, be able to tell the difference between big and small, important and trivial? I hope you enjoyed our showcase and that the short extracts our wonderful translators have read are making you gun for more. Lucky for you, you have to look no further than the NCW website, where you can read longer versions in this year's digital anthology at the link on the following slide. If you prefer a physical copy of the anthology, you can also register to have it posted to you via our website. And if you're interested in any or all of our translation activities and programs at NCW, please go to our website at www.nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk slash translation. Applications for the 2023-24 program will open in July 2023. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.